And welcome to Women Talk. I'm Beth Badalino, co-founder of Healthy Women and your host of Women Talk. Healthy Women launched Women Talk as part of our live webinar series to bring healthcare professionals and patients together to connect about their health. And we are so proud to present current and up-to-date information brought directly to you from guests who are top healthcare providers, researchers, experts, advocates, and leading professionals in their fields. At Healthy Women, we bring you authentic, engaging, and personal stories from women for women. And on this episode of Women Talk, we are going to be discussing how to have your best life in midlife. This week, I am so proud to welcome my friend and guest, Patricia Garrity, who's one of Healthy Women's Women's Health Advisory Council member and is a practicing nurse practitioner who has advanced training in women's health with a post-master's degree as a family nurse practitioner. She was an associate professor at the fir- and the first coordinator of the Family Nurse Practitioner Program at Holy Names University in California. She now provides concierge service to women, which gives her the ability to address multiple issues in a single appointment. Who would not love that? And to be readily accessible to all of her patients. All I can say, Patty, is I wished you lived next door. So let's jump in now and welcome Patty. Thank you, Beth. Thank you so much for this opportunity to be here. Uh, We always love having you, and I'm especially excited about today's topic because I know it's near and dear to your heart um, as you're now doing your concierge practice and seeing so many lovely women. But March is a big month for women. In addition to being Women's Health History Month, we also are celebrating International Women's Day. So we thought it would be a great time to share some tips with our viewers on how they can have their best life in midlife, which is what we believe at Healthy Women. And what are the few things um, that you personally prioritize, Patty, when it comes to maintaining your own happy and healthy life? Well, I think I'm not alone when I say that my, after two years of pandemic, my list has changed a little bit. There's the, the very obvious move a lot, don't smoke, eat lots of plants, but I've certainly added to that as a health need, social connections. And I think that's a big topic that's coming up in medicine now is loneliness and the the harm that loneliness causes. So in my own life, that's one of the other things I'm assessing. And with my patients, that's one of the other things I'm assessing is who are you connected to? Not just your support system, but but who, who feeds your emotions? Um, I I think that most women, uh, virtually all the women I meet, know what they need to do. The famous movie, Plants Don't Smoke Things. But with women, what we really need to concentrate on is how to do it. In midlife, women typically have multiple demands on their time. They may be raising children at any stage. Midlife women have toddlers all the way to college students few empty nesters. They may be entering some of the most demanding years of their profession. They may have elderly parents that need care. So pulled in a lot of directions. And we need to help them schedule the being healthy. I volunteer at a free clinic and most of my patients there are monolingual Spanish speaking. So I'll ask them, are you active? And they'll just say no. And they're, you know, guilt all over their faces. And I'll say, wait a minute, let's look at this. Do you drive? No, she walks everywhere she needs to go. What do you, what is your employment? What is your work? Well, I clean about five or six houses a day. That's plenty active. So we need to give ourselves credit for what we are doing and, and assess that not the perfect cookie cutter, how to get things done, but what did I get done today? I love that. I love that. Thank you. Um, And and it's so true because I know even there's times when I have to work, um, you know, when I work at the hospital and I kind of get, I'm thinking, oh, I'm not getting my work on workout in this weekend. But then when I come home and I'm thinking about, I didn't sit down the whole 12 hour shift, you know, I'm wondering how many steps did I get in after this shift was over? Um, And you're right. You need to give credit where credit's due. Um, Next question I have for you is, 
We know that women prioritize everyone else's health before their own. And we know at Healthy Women that's so true because we're we're all about research and we see it all the time when we do a survey. We know that even our family pet gets their vet appointment. Um, we make, make, make sure that they have time for their checkups. So especially after the pandemic, when many women have put off their own annual wellness visits, can you tell us why it's so important to keep up with preventative care, and what are the must-have screenings that we should be receiving? That's a great question. And and first, my my patients are trickling back in, and they're all apologizing, like uh, confessing I haven't been here in so long. And I'm like, you're here, you know, or you've called for the appointment. You're taking the steps. So again, give yourself credit. As far as screening tests, that the terrific question because there've been a lot of changes in screening tests. One of them is cervical cancer screening, which was formerly called a pap test, and even before that, a pap smear. We've always called our annual gynecological exam, I'm going for my pap smear. And that's, I think, hurting women now, because as we know more about cervical cancer and understand the progress of it, we understand the relationship to human papillomavirus, HPV, and that it is a much more slowly acting scenario than expected. So now with cervical cancer screening, if we look for HPV and we look at the cells, co-testing, mm -hmm. and both those things are normal, we know that you have five years before you need further cervical cancer screening. Nothing significant is going to happen. So that can hurt women by saying, I don't need a pap test. I don't need to go in. And there is more to you than just your cervix and more to you than just one disease, cervical cancer. So some of the other screening, mammogram. The guidelines are all over the place for mammograms. Much of the world doesn't start mammograms until age 50 and they do them every other year. Well, we have data from Sweden now that only a few women are affected by delaying mammogram stage 50, but that affect is they die. So that's a pretty big deal. I like the American Cancer Society guidelines, which are start at age 45 and do it every year, 45 to 55. Why? Cancer is very rare in that age. The typical age of breast cancer is 70. But if it occurs 45 to 55, it tends to be more aggressive. So it doesn't make sense to wait two years. And then discuss with your clinician, should I start earlier at 40? And at 55, should I then go to every two years or should I continue at every year? Mm -hmm. Other screening that has changed in a big way is colon cancer screening. We used to think of that as something old people did. But in fact, we want to start screening for colon cancer via colonoscopy or an equivalent test looking at the DNA at age 45. So that's smack dab, midlife, busy women. Let's fit that one in. And then another one that has changed is bone density. And a lot of my patients will ask me, can I get a bone density screen at age 50? I want a baseline. You need screening for bone density, but that doesn't need, mean you actually need the DEXA, which is the imaging of the bone density. You need screening for other factors that might cause bone loss earlier than expected. And a multitude of factors are involved. And we know very well people on chemotherapy, they should be getting regular screening. Um, hyperparathyroid, so if you have elevated calcium in your blood. But if you've also had a fracture, and any woman 50 or over, any individual 50 or over, who has a fracture from standing height, that's called a low impact fracture, immediately needs bone density screening. Otherwise, without additional risk factors, we start that screening at age 65. And that frustrates a lot of my patients. They wanna know sooner than that. And the reason that 65 was chosen is because that's sort of the age where fractures can turn fatal. Right. or can turn long-term morbidity. So always we want to talk about promoting bone health, regardless of your age. Um, but 65 is when we would start, in the absence of other risk factors, routine screening. Finally, screening looks at individual issues. Your annual wellness exam is important, again, because there's so much more to you. I love, thank you so much, Patty. So for all of those who are listening or watching us today, make sure that you schedule 
your annual women's wellness visit and make sure you take advantage of the preventative screenings that are covered by the Affordable Care Act to include cervical cancer screening, mammograms, bone density, and colon cancer screening. Our next question is about vaccines. So what about the role of vaccines and which ones do we need to make sure we have as we're in midlife? And that's an excellent question because we think of vaccines as a childhood thing, but I'd love to get into our collective consciousness, the idea that vaccines pop up again in midlife. Now, one that pops up obviously long before midlife is the annual influenza vaccine. Influenza is a virus, the virus changes every year. So they tight trait tape tailor the virus to what they think will be the strain coming at us this year. And that is very important. It saves lives. Influenza deaths are 30 to 50,000 people a year. Um, and, but it also saves quality of life and time. We already talked about how busy women's lives are midlife. And if you have two weeks to take off having influenza or the flu, um, I'd rather spend it at the beach. Thank you very much. Additionally, the influenza vaccine does reduce the number of common colds you have. So the argument, well, I've never had influenza. Why should I get the vaccine? It's how many colds have you had? Typically three to six a year. Would you like to have fewer than that? Another one that pops up is the shingles vaccine. Yes. Um, it's a relatively new vaccine, but it also is absolutely about quality of life. Shingles is caused by the zoster virus, the same virus that causes chickenpox. And this vaccine prevents that, that, that virus from waking up again and causing shingles. Shingles can be fatal in immunocompromised people. But the big message here is not fatality, it's quality of life. Mm -hmm. I don't think any of us are going to argue about how important quality of life is. And shingles can have the complication of chronic pain. Now, our bodies have lots of ways they can give us pain as we get older. And if there's one of those sources of pain that we can prevent, let's do it. I agree, 100%. Pneumococcal vaccine, pneumonia, that's for a bacteria. And that one is at later age, at 65. And that's because after a viral infection in the 65 or older adult, a virus can set up a weakness in the lung structure where bacteria can cause pneumonia and pneumonia can be fatal. And then another vaccine, Tdap, tetanus diphtheria pertussis. That should be done every 10 years, but new guidelines here. If you are going to be around a child under 12 months of age, because pertussis has come back in the big numbers, you want to get a Tdap booster to protect that child until that child can get their own vaccines. So this is sort of the grandma shot. Mm -hmm. Someone in your family is expecting a baby. You want to spend some time with that baby. Go in and get your Tdap shot. Could not agree more. And we're seeing that we're doing that a lot more on the maternity and postpartum floor too, is making sure people are up to date with all, all of their vaccines. And we need to give a shout out to COVID-19, right? If you haven't gotten vaccinated, use this time um, to do so. And if you haven't gotten your booster, please go get your booster because we do know that it's saving lives. And what we don't know enough about yet is long COVID. Right. But the origin, the initial research looks like 20 to 30% of people who got COVID have long COVID. And that it didn't isn't correlated with how sick you were when you had the COVID. <clears throat> mild is mild case of COVID can still yield long-term symptoms. Six months, 12 months, we haven't necessarily found an endpoint for those symptoms yet. So the vaccine definitely helps protect against that. So now I'm gonna dive into menopause, which we know is a natural stage of women's life, but we often see it cast in a negative light. But here at Healthy Women, we're all about positivity and ensuring aging smart and aging well. Every woman is aging smart and aging well. And we educate women on what they need to know in each season of their lives. What three things, Patty, have you found helpful for yourself as well as your patients that should be part of that midlife toolkit? So before we get to those three really important things, let's also acknowledge that every woman's menopause is unique and yes. attitudes about menopause differ very much around the world. 
um, in India, menopause is seen as a very positive thing because you acquire more roles and more leadership in the temple, which is the center of the community. So it isn't necessarily a negative viewpoint, even socially. But those three things with every woman's menopause being different, one is I don't want women to be afraid of hormones. That, that hormone fear came from a study in 2002. And I, I like to point out to my currently entering the menopause transition patients that in 2002, they were just finishing up puberty. All right. That's a, that's a pretty old test. Right. It was an important test because it really gave us information. At that time, hormones were so supported that that test was about should not not about should I ever use hormones, but rather about they're great. Should I use them my whole life? Right. And the answer for that is no, there is a time and a place for hormones. Um, are hormones linked to, to breast cancer, which is what that study, the Women's Health Initiative showed. Yes, if you're using estrogen, you have a uterus, you're also using progesterone to protect that uterus, and you're using them for more than five to 10 years. We can't say where in the five to 10 years, but by 10 years, and that's where the guidelines say, right. 10 years after natural age of menopause, look at other methods of managing these hot flashes and night sweats. Okay. But prior to that, we don't see an increased risk. Also important is the one size fits all approach. No, no. Um, you know, hot flashes, night sweats are given a lot of attention in, in North America and Europe where they are the predominant symptom. But in the rest of the world, muscle aches and pains and joint pains are number one. Uh, the threesome of muscle pain, joint pain, hot flashes, night sweats, and sleep disruption mm -hmm. are the threesome from around the world. So we need to address, we need to listen to her story and address her issue specifically. Ah. Uh. Um, OTCs, do they help over the counter things? Yes, they really help the companies that produce them. Uh -huh. <laughs> they make a lot of money. And women, again, because of a justified or unjustified fear of hormones, often tend to the turn to the over the counter first. The issue around all the things we do for menopause is there's a really high placebo effect. And that's complicated. And I, I really am looking forward to more research being done on that. Women are very much motivated to feel better. Are they getting a placebo because of that? But as we understand more of what's going on in the brain causing hot flashes and night sweats, is there some way that a placebo can, can impact that? So whenever we study anything to help menopause, we always have to study it against a placebo. And frankly, it's hard to beat the placebo. And we know, again, things that absolutely do, hormones being the gold standard, but there are other options also. So what happens to the woman who's turning to over-the-counter first? Um, she's buying a product, it's working for a few months, and then it wears off, that placebo effect is gone. She buys another product. And as long as she is feeling better, that's our goal. And as long as she's not using something potentially harmful. But you also want her to look at how much money is she spending on these products? Because we kind of don't tend to count the over-the-counter medications as healthcare expenses. No, you're absolutely right. You, we don't. We don't save those uh, receipts and think about how much we spent over the last three or four months on over-the-counter products. So no, I, I, it's a great point. And thank you so much for addressing some questions. Even the, the Healthy Women team sent in. So I, I appreciate that. Um, Speaking of menopause, as a women's health expert who you've dedicated much of your time helping women manage their menopause transitions, you have recently edited a book called Each Woman's Menopause, an evidence-based resources specifically created for nurse practitioners, advanced practice nurses, and allied health professionals. But what's so great about this book is it provides updated information on how to improve that menopause discussion between clinicians and patients. I know it was a true labor of love because I remember talking to you when you were in the depths of editing and rewriting some of that book. Tell me, why do you feel that this book was necessary and what do you want people to learn from reading it? Well, thank you, another great question. Women are, thanks to the efforts of healthywomen.org and, and many other 
agencies, women are becoming more knowledgeable about menopause. They want to know, they're doing their research. For years, I've kind of said, where's the Lamaze class for menopause? We yes. all went to a childbirth preparation class. Yes. Where's the class for menopause? And, and Healthy Women is filling that need in today's method, social media. But once a woman knows what she needs, it's very hard for her to find a clinician that can meet those needs. In medical school, the training on menopause is zero to one hour in the entire medical, medical school curriculum. So either none or maybe an hour. And as an advanced practice nurse, nurse practitioner, I can say in the general nurse practitioner, it wasn't much different. In women's health, we devoted a lot more time on it. But you, none of us want to see any clinician that's still practicing according to the way they were educated, perhaps 20 or 30 years ago. We want someone who's up to date. And so that's where my patients say, why didn't you write this book for us? But the absolute need is we need clinicians who are ready to see the patients who know what they're talking about. Well, all I can say is thank you. Thank you so much for creating um, such a great uh, resource for healthcare providers because it is needed um, and, and we love, love you for doing that. So thank you. Um, my next question is, March is also known as, so not only International Women's Day um, and Women's History Month, but it's also Sleep Awareness Month. And no one I know, well, no one I know sleeps well between children, work, everyday life, responsibility, the changes in our bodies um, that are going on in our 40s, 50s, and 60s, hot flashes, you know, sleeping and even solid six seems like it was so long ago. Is there a magic pill? Awesome question. So let me address the magic pill part first before we go back. No, 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 please no. Um, you know, there are a bazillion sleeping pills, but none of them were really ever studied for long-term use. And when what we call the Z drugs, Zolpidem, is this, uh, what are brand names, Ambien, Lunesta, Sonata, came out, they're fantastic sleeping pills, but they are not designed for long-term use. And it's so simple when everyone comes in saying, I'm having trouble sleeping to simply write a prescription. The discussion about really how to sleep better takes a lot more time. So we wrote these prescriptions and all of these drugs are dependency forming. That's a little different than addiction. Mm -hmm. You don't go through withdrawals, but you can't go to sleep without the presence of those drugs. I did a lot of investigation of the literature to find out when, how long, when is safe enough. And I couldn't find anything except one study out of Japan where they had the sleep receptors, the GABA receptors in the lab and exposed them to Zolpidem. And within seven days, the structure of the sleep receptor changed so that it no longer worked unless the drug was present. Now in the human, that means I can't go to sleep unless I take my sleeping pill. So travel, time zone changes, perhaps there's a place for these, but they've now become controlled substances. Um, but I have lots and lots of patients that are dependent upon them and that's a whole woman talk discussion in and of themselves, getting off of them. But what can all of us do that are having sleep problems? Well, we sleep differently at different stages of life. And unfortunately, fortunately, we never go back to infant sleep, right? right. Um, infants literally have no melatonin. They do not know the difference between day and night. And then a young child, a good night's sleep is 12 hours. Sounds heavenly, doesn't it? It does. It really does. <laughs> but as we get older, when we're in stage one, the lightest sleep, we're sleeping ever more lightly than we ever have. Um, I've lived in my house over 40 years. Now the sunlight coming in through the kitchen across the hallway into my bedroom wakes me up. Oh. It never used to. So step one is our environment. We need to have it very good for sleeping. It needs to be dark. It needs to be the right temperature. We also spend less time in what is called slow wave sleep. And slow wave sleep is where cognitive functions are sort of restored and changed. And there's a lot of research going on saying, is that actually what is attributable to the menopause transition symptom of foggy brain, mm -hmm. that we're not correlating those memories. 
So sleep medicine, relatively new specialty within medicine itself, 30 years old. Again, none of us better be practicing how we were trained decades ago because we didn't know anything then. But the gold standard of sleep medicine is something called cognitive behavioral therapy of insomnia. Cognitive, learn that I'm sleeping more lightly, learn how to keep my environment correct, learn how to get a routine around bedtime. Behavioral, the big issue that I see with my menopause transition patients is not necessarily difficulty getting to sleep. That's older age. So no delayed onset of sleep, but we wake up and our mind is racing and we're solving the problems of the world. First, we have to recognize that's not productive thinking. We wake up in the morning and it's like, why was I so worried about that? I'll tell my patients, don't send that email, okay? Wait till the morning light gives you some perspective. Um, so, but you're worried about, again, lots of demands on our time. You can jot down the concern. That's one technique, a behavioral technique for getting back to sleep. And then mindfulness therapy is huge. I have a lot of resources where I live of mindfulness therapists that my patients with insomnia that I'll send them to, because that's, you, it's acquiring a skill. Sleeping is changing your neural behavior of your brain, and you can purposefully do that, but it's a skill that needs to be acquired. All of these techniques take a while, so patience is important. They're skills, you're acquiring them. But be, why are they the gold standard? Once you've acquired those skills, they're your benefit lifelong. Whereas the sleeping pill, as soon as you stop taking them, the insomnia is back. It's back. Such, a, you know what? I think we're we're going to have to do another show, Patty, on sleep. I think that's that's going to definitely we're going to do another woman talk on sleep. Thank you so much for that great information. And now I'm going to open it up to our audience and see what questions they have for us. Speaking of sleep, what do you think about melatonin? Fantastic question. So melatonin, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine says, no, don't use it. And NICE, which is the European British organization around guidelines, says, yes, you can use it. So we have these conflicting guidelines internationally. We don't know enough about long-term use. That's the conservative response of the American Academy. Melatonin is the, it's not, it doesn't make us sleepy. That's a big myth. What it does is it teaches us when to sleep. Our melatonin makes us daytime animals instead of nighttime animals. So it's produced in the brain at night. Can we take a supplement? Maybe. The supplements are extremely rapidly metabolized and melatonin needs to be used all night to say this is a nighttime animal sleep time. So the supplements are metabolized within 30 minutes to two hours. They're not going to do that, keep you asleep thing, unless you use a slow release. And so a slow release. Also, what about the dose? In the United States, the over-the-counter doses are anywhere from three to 10 milligrams. Right. The recommended dose from NICE is one milligram slow release. So we're not, there's so many unknowns. That's, that's the take home message about melatonin, disagreement in the guidelines and unknowns, but it isn't to make you sleepy. It is to tell your body that this is the sleeping time. The circadian sleep system is what it acts on. Great to know. Next question. What are your thoughts on multi-collagen peptides? Um, so I'm, I'm not sure what your goal is with the multi-collagen peptides. And the other question about them is what is your delivery method? So if you're, if you're taking collagens orally and, and collagens are part of the structure of the human body, the structure of our skin, the structure of our ligaments, the stru structure everywhere. Uh, I'll tell my patients when we talk about sun protection that we think we're getting away with sun damage, not wearing sunscreen, not wearing hats. But you might not know when you've hit menopause as in your final menstrual period. Your skin does. Overnight, it's going to show up with every wrinkle that you've induced over the years and years of sun exposure. So I think that's a goal of a lot of women taking these oral collagens. And there isn't any evidence that taken orally that they do get absorbed or delivered to the target organ, in this case, your skin. 
I'm seeing a lot more advertising for the multi collagen peptides, so I'm sure that's that's the reason you got that question. Uh, thank you for a great discussion. I eat healthy, but as I age, I also have been taking supplements. Um, should I also be taking supplements? If so, which ones would you recommend? Which ones do we really need? Super question. And again, guidelines are all over the place with nutritionists saying you don't need any supplements if you're eating healthy. None of us are eating perfectly. Okay, let's let's take that down and do it. So as a safety net, what do you need? Well, I start with my patients with vitamin D first, because vitamin D is not typically found in our food. It's found in sun exposure. So right now we have the bone people arguing with the skin people, right, about the sun exposure. But we also don't metabolize D that well from sun exposure as we get older. So a vitamin D supplement, it's a fat soluble supplement. The Good news is it's fat soluble. The bad news is we've got plenty of storage compartments. So you can take it on a daily basis. So you can take a higher dose on a weekly basis. If you're going to go to another supplement, it would probably be the omega-3s, omega-6s. The nutritionists say we don't need them as long as we're getting 12 ounces of fish in our diet every week. Mm -hmm. Very few people are doing that. So adding the omega-3s, omega-6s immunity, brain function, a lot of things that those are involved with. And then finally, if I'm going to add a supplement to a patient, I'm going to assess how much calcium she's getting in her diet. Um, if she's getting three good sources of calcium every day, she doesn't necessarily need a supplement. If it's less than that, then let's do exactly what the name of the pill says, supplement one dose or two doses daily. Great. Next question. Metabolism, metabolism, I can't even talk, decreases as we age, especially after menopause. How can we combat this? Best question. And I didn't write that chapter in my book. I'm going to say I didn't want to even tackle that one. Um, Maya Feller, who's a registered dietitian in, in New York, did it. Um, great job. And what does happen is if we talk, met metabolism decreases with age, and so we don't really see a menopause transition related drop in metabolism. It's a gradual age related drop in metabolism. So conversely, weight gain increases with age. What does change with a menopause transition is body composition. And that's where we add abdominal girth. And so prior to menopause, if we gained or lost weight, women, it was in the hips, it was in the breasts. And then after menopause, it's in the abdomen, which is much less acceptable. Combating it, the same answers that every nutritionist is going to give you for everything. Move, eat the right foods. Move it. Okay, so we go back to exercise and eating right. That's awesome. Any more questions from the audience? I think we're up. I think we've got them all. That's great. Well, thank you so much for being here and for being such an attentive and engaged audience. Please join us on April 11th at 1 p.m. for our next episode of Women Talk, Healthy Wallet with the Savvy Ladies. Patty, thank you again for such great information, such great advice for midlife women. And I'm so thankful for your time today. Thank you. I, I love the work you do and I love spending time with you. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Women Talk. Stay tuned for more Healthy Women Live events at www.healthywomen.org. You can also follow us at Healthy Women on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, or LinkedIn. Or follow us on Instagram at healthywomen.org. We'll see you next time.